Okay, guys. Um, just a quick announcement about recitations. If for some reason something insane is going on and you need to skip recitation, don't just skip it. Email me and I will let you come to another session. Now, don't just take this as you can come to any session you want because that's not okay. But if you email me, I'd rather you not lose 10 points by not showing up. Okay? Now, if you don't care about 10 points because you're going to kick butt on everything, then it's up to you. Okay. So, quick business. The extra credit from the other day about um, Golgi. Um, I was a little bothered by the fact that no one really answered the question. Um, and I think this is common, and so I bring it up to educate you on how to read the question and think about the question and then answer the question. Because the question was, does every protein need to go to every compartment of the Golgi? Let's say you have a, a secreted protein that's not glycosylated at all, um, or has or has, doesn't have too many modifications. I don't know what it is. Does it need to go to every single compartment or not? And so we have the discussion about cisternal maturation. Well, then obviously because you're kind of progressing through the whole thing anyways, but um, vesicular transports kind of go in separately to each um, compartment. And so does it need to go to each one? And I'd say of the 30 or so responses I got, 28 of them were just an explanation of vesicular transport and cisternal maturation. That wasn't the question. Right? Or some people just emailed me a file, and that not that they wrote, but just a paper, like that they found on the internet, but didn't say anything about it. So you don't get extra credit for not answering the question and for not saying anything. And some people um, really made a very strong effort, and so those people I'll give... Um, the points to, I think there was only one or two of them, but um, I just want you to, before you hit send, because I know everyone's in a rush to get things done, go back, read the question, say, did what I write answer the question? Because it's very easy to be like, ooh, Golgi. Let me write about Golgi, when that wasn't the question. Um, so I don't know what the answer is, because I did a little research myself, and it doesn't appear to be clear. And so you could easily go through everything you read and say, well, I'm not really sure what the answer is, and you would get the points for that. Sometimes there is no answer. That's the amazing thing about research. Sometimes it's something that's still being looked at or that people are looking at it, and we don't even know they're looking at it because they haven't found anything, so they haven't published. No one publishes when they don't know it yet, right? So anyways, there's my rant. Okay. Questions about extra credit. Um, there was also the extra credit that's due tomorrow that was the make the cell dance movie thing. I've had a few people inquire. I didn't really say much about it in class, but um, that was a 20-point extra credit um, if you win. 10 points if you try. So go back and look if you're freaking out. Um, okay, so where have we been and where are we going? So we started out talking about mRNA becoming a functional protein, right? The things that can happen to the RNAs that result in it not being a functional protein. The reason I do this is because I have a lot of people who ask me, like, how to fit it all together. So I'm trying to bring you all back to somewhere. Um, then we started talking about the secretory pathway with import of proteins into the ER, only proteins that are going to be going to certain places go to the ER. And then we spoke about getting to the Golgi and back to the ER. Why would a protein need to go back to the ER? Uh, yeah. Okay. That was the answer. Um, because it's a resident protein of the ER, right? Um, we, then we started to talk, and then we spoke about the function of the Golgi in trimming and modifying um, and adding sugars. And then we started to talk about um, transport to the lysosome and what, what causes things to go to the lysosome, what tag needs, what, what needs to be added to a protein to send it to the lysosome. 
Mano six phosphate. Okay, I'm six P. Um, and so we'll do another two or three slides on that, and then we'll talk about endocytosis because things that are endocytosed often also go to the lysosome. So there's two directions of things that go to the lysosome. Okay, so this is where we ended. We had our very quick stop and talk to your friend about lysosomal storage disease, and we decided that there was a defect in either lysosomal hydrolases or um, the enzyme that adds mannose 6-phosphate or the mannose 6-phosphate receptor and kind of decided it must be either the enzyme that adds mannose 6-phosphate or the receptor because it was all lysosomal hydrolases, not just one because there are many. <coughs> okay, so... Um, this is where we ended. So we were talking about mannose 6-phosphate receptors and how they bind to mannose 6-phosphate on whatever protein in the trans gold gene network and the vesicle buds and takes it to the um, endosome, right? Okay. So how is it released in the endosome? Well, it's kind of the same story as what we had with the KDEL receptor is pH-dependent interaction. So it binds nice and tightly at a pH of 6.5, 6.7, which is the pH in the trans Golgi network. And then it loses that interaction at pH of 6, which is the pH of the lysosome. So that makes a lot of sense, right? And then... Um, then, of course, you know, you don't want to leave all your mannose 6-phosphate receptors in your lysosome, right? No. We want them to be able to go back to the trans Golgi network where it could pick up more proteins and bring them back. So it's the same kind of re – it's similar to the KDAL story where you're um, – you have something recycling, just something recycling, um, except for there's no KDAL involved. Okay. So make sure you understand this mechanism for binding and releasing things and how it's pH dependent because that's a theme. I love themes. So I might ask on an exam something like pH often regulates binding of proteins to other proteins and blah, blah, blah. How does this cell use this to, um, you know, help sort proteins in the circulatory pathway? Provide two examples. And you should right off the bat right now be going, ah, ER, KDEL, mannose 6-phosphate, M6P receptor, and then be able to... So, you know, later when you're listening to this, write that down. Make sure you can go through that exercise. It may or may not ever show up on an exam, but if you can start to identify those kind of themes, then you'll be able to prepare really nicely for exams. Okay. Um... So how does the receptor know to recycle? So how does it get sent back? Who wants to guess? Who wants to just hypothesize how the receptor is going to know to go back? Okay, so whenever... Okay, so... Something about it's not binding to its cargo anymore, maybe. What else? It's pretty much like after it releases cargo, it changes temperature with it, and then I guess it kind of like signals out to the cells. Okay, so something about conformational change when it's not binding cargo, something about some kind of signal patch or signal sequence. Uh, what else? Right, some kind of protein coat. Okay, so I'm not going to give you the exact mechanism, but it pretty much is you guys just were able to use what you already know to hypothesize what's happening here, about what's happening here. And you guys are all right. It's a similar mechanism to the recycling of, of the KDEL receptor. Um, and basically, it binds to a different kind of protein coat, and it goes back to the Golgi. So that's how science works, right? You're always like you have no, you have knowledge and you use the knowledge you have to think about something that's not known. So if you needed to identify some kind of 
signal, um, some kind of signal patch or some kind of sequence that might help send, help send this receptor back. What would you do? Based on what we've spoke about, spoken about already with signal sequences and signal patches and KDEL and what would you do just to, you know, you have all the tools, you have microscopy so you can follow where things are, you have um, recombinant DNA technology so you could mutate things and chop things off and what would you do to prove or to identify a certain sequence that's, that's required for, let's say, binding to the protein coat so it can go back? Yes. Okay, start chopping up the protein and see where it goes, right? Right? Okay, so you chop up the protein and you find out. Let's just do this exercise for fun. Here's your protein of your, of your um, M6P receptor, and you chop it here and here and here. So you end up with a protein that's this long. You end up with a protein that's this long. And you end up with a protein that's this long. And you find out that um, this one, this one goes where it should go, um, and this one does not, and this one does not, but this one does. So, what would you think? Where would you think that magical sequence would be? Right, what's do? A B C D. This is A B C. A, B, A, C, C, you think that it would be in C? Who said that? You think it would be in C? Huh. Let's see. Let's see if that's the only possible answer. Yes? Well, if it's a signal patch, couldn't it be possible that none of the chunks would go back because the tertiary structure would be affected? Right, but I'm giving you the data. Absolutely. That's another possible data you might have, right, where only this would go and none of these would go, right? And then it would be because some kind of folding thing happens and that's messed up and, and there's just no, it's just not going to... So that's it. so. If you got this data, you might start thinking either it's here or it's signal patch, right? Um, but we got this data, so that means that this one's not important, right? Um, but this was very important, right? Because as soon as we got rid of it, it stopped going. So what would you do then? Oh, yeah. So you can try to cut off A and B just to make sure that's always, you always want to do things to be complete. Um, and then the other thing you can do is just make C by itself and see where it goes, right? Okay. Um, you might at some point see some kind of question like this where we chop up proteins and there's some kind of data I give you. So it's definitely important to understand that different proteins have different um, <laughs> different domains that do different things, and the way that we study them is usually to get rid of them and see if the something changes. Okay. Okay, any questions about that before I move on? Okay, so does everyone feel good? Did I answer your question from the other day about the receptor? Okay, I thought I was going to get to it there. Okay, good. Um, so, right, so the lysosome is not always the end of the line, right? So we're talking about things going to the lysosome. Um, you know, we're sending all of our acid hydrolysis there because the lysosome is the place where we degrade things. Things that go to the lysosome from the plasma membrane are going to be degraded. Often, yes, but there's also a process just to be aware of called lysosomal secretion. And that's where the lysosome will fuse back with the plasma membrane and spit things out. Um, so that, that's one way it will um, remove things that are not digestible when the cell's under a lot of stress. Um, but also some cells use this under normal conditions. And that is how you get your skin color, right? So you have melanocytes that make melanin and they store the pigments 
in the lysosome. Um, and they release that pigment through lysosomal secretion into the extracellular space, and it's taken up by keratinocytes, and that's how you get your skin color. So um, albinism <coughs> is actually a defect in the exocytosis of the melanosome. There's some interest, interesting data for you. Yes? Well, I think it's under stress things become not digestible. I'm not sure because, right? Right, okay, that's a good question. Well, the question was what, I'm sure if we thought about it for a long time, I can come up with something. But, um, but the question was what kind of debris is not digestible? Um, well, there are um, all these acid hydrolases that can d digest every single thing you can think of that we'd find in the cell. So, yeah, what kind, and this does happen just under stress. I don't know, maybe some, um, there's some heavy metals or something like that taken in from the environment or, yes? Carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes, there you go. Okay, tell us more. Carbon nanotubes uh, <laughs> that are that get formed through different processes actually can cause cancerous growth in cells because they're not digestible. And the cell tries to attack them and then basically goes boom. So are they, do they come to the environment? Usually it's because of um, somebody in a lab coat. Okay, so something about people in lab coats jacking people up on carbon nanotubes and cancer, right? Yeah. Something to that effect. Well, we I think I want to know more about this. Send me a link. Okay. Um, so carbon nanotubes. So things. So so from the environment usually of some sort. I don't mean just like out in nature environment, but from outside the cell, something um, that might come in and be indigestible, may, such as carbon nanotubes. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so albinism, this is a defect in melanism exocytosis. Okay, so let's draw. So I want you to sit with your friend for a minute, and I want you to draw out transport of lysosomal proteins from the Golgi to the late endosome. Make sure you include lysosomal protein with correct modification, correct receptor, <coughs> vesicle formation, including adaptin and clathrin, mechanism for <coughs> protein binding in the Golgi and release in the late endosome. Um, I want you guys to do that for the next five minutes. Five minutes. Even if, even if it's like not beautiful, I'm not grading you on it. It's an exercise. Work through it together. You'll learn something. It's hard to figure out how to start. Start with a cell. <laughs> Which model? Wait, wait, wait. That's not the question. But that's so part of the Golgi. But you're talking. It's actually. It's. But we're not talking about anything going through the Golgi, right? We're talking about things leaving the Golgi, going to the lysosome. So trans Golgi network to the lysosome. Don't go ER Golgi. Don't do all that. Just Golgi. Utilize. That's actually a thank you because things can sometimes not be clear and you should always ask on an exam. Because I don't need the extra work and you need some extra time. Yeah.
And like it's still attached to the uh, Okay, guys, a quick clarification. I'm not asking ER to Golgi to lysosome. I'm asking lysis um, Golgi, trans Golgi network to lysosome. That's it, right? Because that actually just happens going from trans Golgi network to lysosome. So I don't need the whole Golgi. I don't need to know anything about that. I need you to understand where the receptor is and where it gets picked up and where it gets dropped off. <coughs> That's what happens when you guys like you sit, you sit in front and like you know, look at what you're doing. But you might want to label, so like go through the list. You got your protein. So you want to make sure you got some new Okay, guys, so that's about five minutes. If you couldn't do it in that time, then we just need to work through it together. I, it's okay. It's not, an, it's not a test, but it was, it's definitely something for you to go back to later and make sure you can do because that shows me that you understand it or shows you that you understand it. Okay, so let's go through this. Should we do it on this thing? Oh, I don't even have a pen. Okay, we're going to use a chalkboard. Okay. Can you guys see over there? Huh? Yeah, but then, and no matter what, so they, they always get screwed over there. Are, can you guys see right here? Or is it a problem? Okay. Okay. So, I said, draw out transport of lysosomal proteins from Golgi to late endosome. So, first I need a Golgi, but really I just care about the trans-Golgi network. And then I need the late endosome or the lysosome. Um, actually, we'll call it the lysosome for ease. Um, 
So T, G, M. Lysosome. Okay, make sure to include lysosomal protein with the correct modification, correct receptor. Okay, so we have a protein. And what kind of receptor does it have? Uh, what kind of modification does it have? Um, 6P. Okay. And so it's going to bind to the M6P receptor, right? So I'll we'll have... There it is. And then you're going to have assembly of everything. So let's see. This is where we'll start to bud out. And so you've got your receptor, your adaptin, and your, oh, your clathrin. Oh, I'm really feeling passionate about this. Okay. And then... M6P and your protein. Okay, so you're budding out. We're, clearly, we're not going to have a long way to go because there's the lysosome. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, clathrin. And then adaptin. <laughs> I'm teaching this class in Thai. Okay, adaptin, adaptin. That's going to be the adapter between your receptor and your clathrin. So that's what helps your receptor bind to the clathrin, which is what's causing the budding. And you're going to have that all around, right? Because that's your coat. So you might have a lot of lysosomal proteins here, right? Okay, there we go. So now, don't forget that you're going to, so you lose your clathrin coat, you still have your receptor because it's an, it's a membrane protein and it's bind to M6P six, uh, six protein, right? And then it's going to fuse, right? Because it doesn't just go magically inside. It's going to fuse. with your lysosome, right? Okay. Uh, so I've got correct receptor, vesicle formation, adaptive clathrin, mechanism for protein binding in the Golgi and release in the endosome. What was that mechanism? How come it's binding here? And it's letting go here. pH. pH. Okay, so pH is higher or lower here? <coughs> higher. So, and then pH is lower here. That would be enough. Like, if you didn't remember, 6.5 to 6.7 goes to 6. And if you just wrote it's higher here and it's lower here, then you'd be good. How do you remember that it's lower in the lysosome? The fact that it's the lysosome and it contains all these acid hydrolases, so it's highly acidic, right? And it's got a proton pump and all those things. Okay. Did I do a good job? You did a great job. <laughs> do I get to keep this job? We'll see. In five years, they'll let me know. Okay. Um, does Does anyone have questions? Is anyone like, okay, that's pretty much what I got. I, I missed a few details. Yes. Uh, yeah, I put I put a whole bunch of receptors there because don't forget when you have a clothing coat, it's all around, and so often you'll get concentration of receptors there and you'll get concentration of proteins that have M6P on them and the, so the vesicle won't contain one protein, it will contain a whole bunch. But each protein has one M6P. Each protein oh, has one M6P. I don't know. Maybe not, but that's... I don't know. But yeah, either way, don't get bogged down with that detail. M6P sends to lysosome. I want to say it does, but I have no idea. It might have a ton, right? Maybe it'll bind tighter to receptor when it has a ton. Yeah. So 
Yeah, so it's actually, let's let's make these interact. I was just kind of like leaving space for ease of understanding. Yeah. Yep, so the adaptin is an adapter. So it actually, so kind of like when you go travel abroad and you need an adapter for your laptop. And you'll like have the plug, you'll have like, it'll be like a plug that looks just like the ones that go into like the Chinese outlets. And you'll attach it to your plug and now you can use your computer. It's an adapter, it's an adapter that adapts clathrin that goes with everything to the M6P receptor. Okay. Did anyone catch that crazy analogy? Okay. Okay. Are we good? Questions? Thoughts? Comments? Does anyone want to drop the class? It's too late. You're stuck with me unless you would draw, but that's like a waste of money, isn't it? Okay. Um, what's this? Oh, right. So I was reminded yesterday about how someone liked the cartoons. So I was like, oh, let me put a few cartoons in. Um, okay. After years of intensive research, we have fi finally have a clear picture of insulin action. You have insulin binds to a receptor. Something happens and then effects. <laughs> and then the little guy's going a long way since the black box concept. Um, well, actually, there's a bit more known about that. But this is my introduction to receptor-mediated endocytosis. Right? Okay, so here's your, here's your receptor, the arm. And here, I guess, is your insulin kind of hanging out on the receptor. And he's going, God, a coated pit. So there's a, co a coated pit. <laughs> and, um, and then you get endocytosis. And then it's delivered. Ooh, look at that. Look at the lysosome. There's like dead, dead things floating in there. I thought that was funny. Okay. So anyways, the whole point is receptors bring things to the lysosome. Um, and we're going to talk about receptor-mediated endocytosis because in the lysosome, they break down into their little parts so they can go on and go do whatever they need to do. Did you like that very scientific explanation? Yes? What's that black thing? The black That's a black box. Oh, okay. Well, we don't know. I don't know. It's a whole bunch of magic. We do know. We, do, we know quite a bit now, but this was from like 1980 when I guess they didn't know. But, you know, it's... When you start to look for cartoons about endocytosis, you're really limited to what's out there. <laughs> Lysosome. There's like one. Okay. Luckily, it was I was laughing in my office by myself. Okay. So endocytosis from the cell surface inward to the lysosome. So now you want to think, oh, there's different ways things get to the lysosome. Sometimes from the Golgi, sometimes from the cell surface. Those are very different jobs, right, of, of the, those things that are going from the Golgi or from the cell surface. So I want you to keep that in mind when you're thinking about these things, that something's coming from the Golgi to the, to the, to the lysosome is going to be something that needs, like a protein that's being made that needs to work in the lysosome. Where it's coming from the cell surface, it's usually something that's bring, being brought in from the cell that needs to be used in the cell or a receptor that needs to be de degraded to turn off signaling. Okay, so this is phagocytosis. It's a kind of endocytosis that you probably have seen many times, right? So this is, oh, let's turn off the lights. <coughs> so here's your cell, here's some bacteria, and here's your, um, so the plasma membrane of the cell comes around like this, right? So this is a white blood cell that's phagocytizing some bacteria. And so that's your, um, stereotypical first time I saw phagocytosis kind of picture. Ready? So everyone's, has everyone seen that before, right? First day of school. Okay. So um, there are, so phagos, um, endocytosis can, can, can happen with different ways, but you should automatically, anytime you think of curving of a membrane, you should think, well, what's causing that membrane to curve? And one of those is clathrin. We already talked about clathrin, but that's also not only involved in budding of vesicles from the Golgi that are going to the lysosome, but also involved in the vesicles that are going to go from the um, plasma membrane to the lysosome. Okay? Um, there's also caviole, um, and they also form these 
vesicles, pinocytic, that's these small vesicles, and, uh, compared to phagocytic, are, which are these huge invaginations. Um, and these are just membrane domains that have lots of GPI-linked proteins and glycosphingolipids <coughs> and cholesterol and keviolin proteins. And they um, invaginate, ba invaginate based on the membrane composition rather than a protein coat causing it to um, bud inwards. Just something to acknowledge and appreciate. Um, so this is right here, see, there they are. Okay, so viruses love to use um, endocytosis to get into cells. SV40 and papillomaviruses will enter the host cell in vesicles derived from caviole. Um, and then also a bunch of viruses also <coughs> like to enter via receptor-mediated endocytosis. Okay, so let's just like, before we start focusing on details, let's zoom back out and try to remember what we've been talking about because I'm trying to really make sure you guys keep the big picture, right? So we spoke about RNAs coming out of the nucleus and binding to ribosomes, and they get taken. They have this signal sequence. They get taken to the ER. They go through the Golgi. They go to the lysosome or the plasma membrane. And, then the, and so that's what we've done so far. And then this is just now talking about coming from the plasma membrane back to the lysosome. Don't forget, all these things happen. There's proteins also that need to live in the cytosol. They need to go to peroxisomes. They need to go to mitochondria. They need to go to chloroplast if you happen to have a chloroplast. They need to go back into a nucleus. So let's always remember this is one pathway, and we'll learn the others later. Okay? So, receptor-mediated mediated endocytosis. So, receptor, so this is just a basic life cycle of a receptor um, based on the LDL receptor example. You guys know what LDL is? Who's had their cholesterol checked? Right, so it, it, it's a low-density lipoprotein, right? It binds to um, lipids, and most importantly, it binds to cholesterol, and it lets you know if you're going to die or not. Um, so, so there's an LDL receptor that binds to LDL and brings the cholesterol into the cell, right? What are you measuring when you go get your cholesterol check? You're measuring the cholesterol in the cell or in the, or in the blood? Okay, just making sure. Okay. Um, so basically, the way recept uh, the stereotypical receptor-mediated endocytosis, you've got your LDL um, bound to your uh, your cholesterol and whatever your whole particle, and it binds to the LDL receptor. You get um, a clathrin-coated pit. See, clathrin is binding to the receptor, right? We have a theme here. What's probably between clathrin and the receptor? Adaptin, right? Um, so then you get your vesicle, which contains your receptor and your LDL, and then your um, clathrin is going gonna, gonna to uncoat, right? And then it will be delivered to the uh, endosome. So when I say endosome, so endosome, lysosome, basically lysosome is your most, ac your most acidic form of an endosome, so it's your, your late endosome and your lysosome. And you have different phases of endosome with increasing levels of acidification. So when I say endosome and I say lysosome, um, it's the same category of organelle. So <coughs> then you'll have, um, at the low pH of the late endosome, you'll have release. Remember, binding of things changes based on pH. So you'll have release of your LDL. And you'll have um, concentration of your receptors and budding off in a re uh, recycling vesicle that will go back up to the plasma membrane. And then your, your LDL will fuse or mature into a lysosome where it will be broken down into its amino acids and lipids and all the things that make up LDL. And it can go on inside the cell and do what it needs to do. Right? What does cholesterol do in the cell? You guys know? Uh, what? 
Membrane. That's a gene expression. Gene expression. I don't know about that. Maybe, but I don't know. That wasn't what I was looking for. But tell me if you've got... Doesn't cholesterol have to do with, like, maintaining membrane stability in certain temperatures? Membrane, yeah. So, basically, making membrane maintain... So, um, cholesterol... Um, cholesterol is a main component of lipid rafts, which has to do with clustering of receptors, but don't worry about that, but basically making membranes. And there are different, membranes not all the same, and there are different um, types of membrane or different uh, lipids in different areas of membrane that has to do with the function. But there's some kind of membrane class you guys can take in this school. Did you guys know that? I think it's a grad class, but you know. Anyways, um, so, so then, so I said something about receptors, recycling. Why would you want to recycle a receptor? Aren't you done with it? No. Right, so in cases that you're not done with it, you're going to recycle it. And in fact, with LDL receptor, it actually transits to the, lice, to the endosome and back to the receptor just on a consistent schedule, like a train. It, 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 it endocytoses and goes back up regardless of if it's bound by LDL. And so just think of it as a train that sometimes has passengers, sometimes not. So it just keeps recycling, keeps bringing in, keeps bringing in. Um, okay. So what if... Uh, so why receptor-mediated endocytosis versus pinocytosis, which is um, just kind of sampling the extracellular environment, or um, other non-receptor-mediated endocytosis. Why would you want receptor-mediated endocytosis? Yes? So you want to bring something specific in, yep. So you can regulate what you're bringing in. If you have pinocytosis, what are you bringing in? Whatever's there, right? Um, it's like taking a drink out of the ocean. Um, <laughs> okay, any other, anyone else want to contribute? Good. Okay, so, right, so if you want, LD, if you want um, LDL, have an LDL receptor, right? If you want insulin, or if, well, yes. Uh, say like start. a cell doesn't want to take it anymore of a certain thing, can that... Can that receptor start being degraded in the lysosome instead of being... Yep, okay. absolutely, and that's in a few slides, yes. If a cell doesn't want to take in something anymore, what's the smartest thing to do? Get rid of the receptor. Take them off the cell surface. Viruses like to do that to cells, too. Um, okay, so what if there were a mutation in the gene encoding clathrin? What would happen to this process? Yeah. No budding, right. So no endocytosis. That'd be bad, right? Bad? Okay. Give me a thumbs up if it's bad. <laughs> no endocytosis is bad. Okay, good. Um, what if there were a mutation in the genes encoding the proton pump in the late endosome? What would happen? No acidification. Hydrolysis won't work. What would happen to LDL and the LDL receptor? It would never be released into the cytosol. It would never be released, so where would it end up? In the cytosol? Well, don't forget, it's going to be recycling back. So actually, it would be back on the cell surface. And that's not very efficient at all, is it? Um, okay. Um, what if... What if there was a, a, a problem with a proton pump in the lysosome? Well, it'd be bad. It'd be bad altogether. But for this process, the, um, the LDL wouldn't break down, and you wouldn't get all the different parts that could be used. You wouldn't have access to that cholesterol you just took in. Um, okay. That's good enough. Okay, so... What if the LDL receptor has a mutation that results in a premature stop codon in the, in the cytoplasmic domain? Okay, yes? It would 
bind to the LDL, but the LDL would just be stuck in the surface of the cell. It would bind to the LDL, and the LDL would be stuck on the surface of the cell. Why? <coughs> that is correct. Why? Well, the hydrophobic domain is in the, in the membrane, but what causes it to come in? What causes endocytosis? Yeah. So maybe like the adaptin and clathrin bind to the... Right, so adaptin binds to the cytoplasmic domain of the receptor, so then it can't bring in clathrin, you can't get endocytosis. Right, absolutely. Okay. Any questions about this? Is anyone like yes? Yeah, I'm good. Can you explain it another way or something? Uh, we will try, and I will ask others to try to explain it also because sometimes having a classmate say it. So, um, so what I'm saying is, so here's your LDL receptor, right? Here's your LDL receptor, and I'm saying there's a premature stop codon in the cytoplasmic domain. So this part that's in the cytoplasm is gone. That round part that's binding to adaptin, not there. So what's adaptin going to bind to if that's not there? Nothing. So without adaptin, you can't bring in clathrin. Without clathrin, you can't get that curvature of the membrane. You can't get endocytosis. Make more sense? Okay. How's everyone doing? Are we doing good today? Okay. So I think you've got a few minutes. I'm not letting you go. Okay, what are the clinical implications of a defective LDL receptor? What's going to be in your blood? Yes. High cholesterol in your bloodstream, right? Because it's not being taken in, right? Um, what kinds of defects might have, well, so it's kind of what we just talked about. All these defects we just talked about might result in high cholesterol. And what does high cholesterol lead to, apparently? Bad things, bad things, okay. Okay, so let's talk about viruses because it's my favorite thing to do. Um, so HIV has a protein called NEF, which we will, I believe, be reading about in recitation, either next week or the week after, um, which down-regulates CD4. Who knows what CD4 is? Immune response protein, right? It's a, how, what does it have to do with HIV? Well, aside from the fact that it degrades it. What is CD4? Does anyone know what the receptor is for HIV so HIV can get into your cell? Does anyone know what kind of T cells HIV likes to infect? HIV loves to infect CD4 positive T cells, which actually begs the question, why does it like to downregulate? That's another story. Um, so HIV NEF downregulates CD4, it also downregulates MHC class 1 and a whole bunch of other immune proteins. But with CD4, what it does is it induces endocytosis by acting as an adapter for clathrin. Brilliant, right? Binds to CD4, brings in clathrin, just like adaptin, and induces endocytosis um, and degradation of CD4. Pretty cool. Way to shut down the immune system, huh? Okay. Um, should we do this? Okay, I'll let you guys go because I cannot tell what time the time really is. But there's like a few minute difference there.